All right, so everybody, thank you for uh, bailing out on the game, but you can't escape it because my slides are off and my presenting thing is not going and I can't change my slide and go. Okay, we're doing this the hard way. Hardware, how does it fucking work? All right, so I do have a slide for that. Anyone not want a spoiler on the match because I'm about to give you one. Awesome, moving on. Um, if you don't care about soccer, please close your ears. If you do like I do, um, the USA has advanced to the next round. <laughs> They lost 1-0, but it was enough because Portugal won 2-1. Two to one. So, yay, go team. Um, <laughs> yay, go team. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, World Cup, what can you do? Okay. All righty. Um, oh, you know why this doesn't work? <laughs> I am a tech professional. And sometimes a moron. Turn that on. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> All right. So, uh, yes, we have had too much caffeine and not enough sleep. Apologies. Um, so, some really quick introductions as to who we are. I'll hand this off to Alexis so she can do her own. Hi, I'm Alexis Rossi. I'm the director of web services at the Internet Archive. And basically that means getting all of the content in, dealing with it while it's there, organizing it, making sure everything's cool, and getting it back out. Okay, and probably half, if not more, of the audience know who I am. I am Vicky Brasseur. Um, you can also call me VM, but people who know me are my friends, like everyone here. Uh, you can call me Vicky. Um, I am the founder of Shoeless Consulting. I do technical business management consulting for uh, startups in San Francisco, as well as uh, open source strategy and tactics. Um, and here's our contact information. Feel free to use it for both of us. So before we get started with the content, of which there is a lot, um, I have some handy links for you. First of all, we have the Internet Archive GitHub repositories. All things IA are there. It's really neat stuff. Um, we have the session notes page for this session. Every single session at Open Source Bridge has a wiki page. We will be posting links there later. Not only these links, but others if we need them. Um, so you can go there. Please add notes. We love adding notes. Um, also, we have a Zotero page. Every single link, every single reference you're going to see in this is in our Zotero citation uh, page here. So you can go there, find all this information. And finally, once we are done here, we are recording this right now. So we will be uploading it to guess where? That's right, Internet Archive. Um, that will probably happen sometime next week because I don't have quite the same bandwidth at work that she does. Um, so uh, don't worry, I am going to give you these slides again at the end. So they will be available also in our slides, which will be linked to the session page, which you can find from the schedule. So with that, I'm going to hand it back off to Alexis, and she is going to give us a tour of Internet Archive. Bring it home. Hey, everybody. So uh, the Internet Archive is located in San Francisco, and uh, this is the building that we're in. It used to be a Christian science church. It was built in the 1920s, and uh, now we, it's like the Church of Information now. So we're, we're super proud of ourselves. Um, <laughs> so we are a 501c3 nonprofit, of course. Um, we're recognized as a library by the state of California, which gets us all kinds of cool stuff like E-rate on uh, bandwidth and Internet 2 access and that kind of stuff which is really cool, but it also means that libraries are pretty happy to work with us because uh, we're one of them. And uh, we have lots of partners that we work with, and I'll talk a little bit about the stuff that we do at the archive. And while, I'll do, while I do that, I'm going to show you pictures of the building because it's pretty, and uh, I like to brag about it. This is the inside of the sanctuary, um, which, of course, we now call the Great Room. Um, so the first thing that people ask me pretty much every single time I do one of these talks is where does the money come from, so let's just get that out of the way. Um, we're about a $12 million a year organization, and um, about $5 million of it comes from digitization projects. Most of those are book digitization projects, although we do also do um, VHS tapes, LPs, Betamax, dot tapes, autocassettes, uh, microfilm, <laughs> lots of other stuff as well, but the books are really the big one. Um, about 20% comes from people paying us to archive the web. We archive the web on our own behalf, but then we also do it for um, people like the National Libraries of Australia and Spain, the Library of Congress, um, and lots of other smaller institutions who use our archive at web service. And then the other 40% comes 
from foundations and donations, but a lot of that foundation stuff actually comes from our founder, Brewster Kale, who set up a foundation and he funds that part. So the nice thing about this setup is we don't kind of live or die based on whether we get grants or not, uh, which makes really good longevity, which of course is important to an institution that intends to be around forever. Um, this is my favorite feature of the great room and uh, they're creepy, aren't they? Like they're just super awesome. Um, I will tell you about those in just a second. But first, let's talk about the people who use archive.org. Um, I think we're about the 170th most popular website in the world at this point. Um, and we get about two million people a day, three and a half million downloads a day, somewhere around there, give or take. Um, so we're actually pretty big. We're like this really big site that nobody's ever heard of, <laughs> except for you guys, which is why we like you so much. Um, because we're a library, one of the biggest and most important things to us is protecting the privacy of our users. And the main way that we do that is by throwing away all of the IP addresses. So when you come to the Internet Archive, we hash your IP address before it goes into a log. We can see what that hashed IP address has done during the day, but I don't even know that you're the same person who comes back the next day. We just throw all that stuff away. It means we don't have a lot of information about who uses the archive, because I don't know where you came from. Um, but at the same time, it protects your privacy, which is really, really important to us as librarians. And yes, I have my own statue. So these statues, <laughs> here, wait, I'll do the um, <laughs> These statues are called the ceramic archivists, just as an aside. And uh, what they do is they honor people who have worked at the archive for three or more years. It's a weird, and it's a little bit creepy. And you should really come and see them. There's about 100 of them in the church, and it, or, sorry, not, it's not a church anymore, in the library. And um, they're, they're really fun to, to play around with, so, you know. Everybody wants to know how we store the stuff. Um, so we run our own data centers. They're not like stuck in somebody else's cloud. Uh, the primary data center is actually in that church building that I showed you. Um, we have very weird uh, data centers. There's no air conditioning, there's no raised floors, there's no nothing, they're really green. We actually use the heat that comes out of the back of the machines to heat the building. <laughs> so it's a really fun setup if you ever want to come look at it. Um, they're about a petabyte in each rack, about four kilowatts per rack. Um, so it's, it's a pretty reasonable setup, although obviously it still costs a lot of money to do 18 petabytes of data, um, particularly because it's duplicated and then there's all this stuff. It's about 50 petabytes of spinning disk. Um, but the main thing everybody knows about us, the Wayback Machine. Um, so we get about 600,000 people a day in the Wayback Machine. And um, we have been doing this since 1996. It's our kind of big thing that we came out with in 2001. We thought everybody was going to sue our pants off. And uh, that didn't happen. Fortunately, lawyers just wanted to sue each other with the Wayback Machine. So that worked out to our advantage, which is great. Um, <laughs> We, uh, if anybody is interested in crawl data, we have an 80 terabyte crawl uh, that you can access and play around with and try to figure stuff out using it. Um, if you're interested in more recent crawl data or that crawl data, just let me know. Um, I'm Alexis at archive.org. You'll see it again at the end. And I have cards over there. Um, so this is uh, EFF over the years, since 1996. And we'll go, we'll go look at one of those soon because I really like to make fun of people's old websites, including ours. Um, <laughs> so how do we crawl content? Why do we crawl that content? Number one, of course, people pay us to do some of it. Uh, like I said, that's about 20% of our yearly budget. Um, but we also do crawling on our own behalf now. We started doing that about four or five years ago. And um, we do deep crawls on uh, starting with the most popular sites, about the top one million or so websites, and we go from there until we sort of start to get really slow and peter out. And then we also do a survey crawl where we take as many domains as we can find, and we do a shallow crawl across all of them. Um, and then we do some targeted crawls, which are a really cool thing that we started doing last year. So uh, we crawl every YouTube video that gets tweeted. We crawl every single outlink that gets put into Wikipedia within a few hours of it being added. We crawl every new page and all of the embedded things and all of the outlinks for every WordPress blog. Um, so those are things that we think people care about and that they're going to want to see later. So we're kind of using it as a filtering mechanism for us um, on a kind of a large scale. So now is our time to make fun of EFF, even though there are our great friends. But check it out, 1996. Who remembers 1996? Yay! <laughs> it's when I got my first internet job, so I totally remember this. This is just, oh my god, terrible. 
Um, so we added a really cool new feature for those of you who are interested. Um, if you have a web page that you're citing somewhere, you're putting in a blog, you know, that kind of thing, you can actually go archive it in the Wayback Machine right now, get back a URL that will continue to live forever, or, you know, as close to as forever as we can get. <laughs> um, so yeah, save page now, it's web.archive.org, and um, you'll get back a URL immediately. So let's talk about what else we do. So since everybody knows about the Wayback Machine. This is a book scanning center. And um, this is microfilm scanning in the center and the book scanners on the side. We have about 32 scanning centers in eight countries, about 100 people working on scanning books every day. We scan about 1,000 books a day. Um, the, like I said, this is our biggest digitization project. We do other formats as well, but books are the thing that people are paying for. So there it is. Um, the uh, unfortunate thing, <laughs> that scanning center that you're just looking at, that's that building right there. Yeah, it burned to the ground in November. Um, it really, really highlighted for us uh, the importance of digitizing these things because we did lose a few things. We don't store things in the scanning centers, but the things that were there that were being scanned, almost all of them had already been scanned. So even though we lost the physical artifacts, which is a terrible shame, um, we didn't lose the information that was in those artifacts. So it really was a, a big wake up call for us and I think for a lot of other people that digitizing things, it isn't just about making them accessible, it's also about helping to preserve them for the future. Um, but we do really, really like our physical artifacts and um, we have a, a physical archive in the San Francisco Bay Area in a town called Richmond. This is it. And uh, we are collecting books and all kinds of other media. So we've got about uh, one and a half million physical books in this uh, center, as well as like 80,000 LP records and 40,000 VHS tapes and these other like ridiculous big numbers. We actually filled this warehouse up completely. <laughs> so we had to go buy a new one. Um, so now we have two physical archives in Richmond and we're working on building a library of 10 million physical books. And the idea is for it to be kind of like a seed bank, right? So you don't, people don't go here to access a physical book. We scan the book and you access the, the digital copy. But we keep the physical one as well because we figure at some point we're gonna have to re-digitize them all for whatever reason. So let's actually keep the books and take care of them as well. So if you are interested in books, the easiest way to find them is a website that we started, openlibrary.org. Um, you can download books, of course, anything that's 1922 or earlier, you can just freely download. Um, things that are more recent, you can borrow from us. We have about 300,000 books that you can borrow for free. And the nice thing about this, of course, you can borrow ebooks from your local library, but we don't have any uh, location restrictions. So anyone in the entire world can borrow a book from us, which uh, we think is really important way to, to get knowledge out there and make sure it's available to everybody. We have lots and lots of video. Uh, we have about one and a half million videos. Um, some of the really fun things there, my personal favorite collection is the Prelinger Library. Um, if you're familiar with Rick Prelinger, he's this great film historian and he is going to be here in Portland tomorrow night um, showing his film No More Road Trips at uh, the Portland Art Museum. It's tomorrow night at 7 p.m. I highly recommend it. It's super fun, I'm probably gonna go. And um, we have lots of other stuff. We have cool cartoons, we have propaganda films, we have newsreels, we have all kinds of great things that you can use in your personal projects or for research or whatever. Um, if you have any stuff you would like to store, like you know the stuff that comes out of that little video camera, this would be a good place to put them. Um, <laughs> But the big thing that we do for um, video right now on our own behalf is we archive television. So we archive about 65 channels of television, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And uh, we have made some of it available. We can't make all of it available yet, we think, but um, archive.org slash TV, this lets you search news. So what you can do is uh, put in the words that you think somebody said in a broadcast and you're actually searching the captions, the closed captioning that gets uh, transmitted with the broadcast when it goes over the air. And um, you can play 60 second snippets. You can cut them into smaller, like little pithy quotes. You can share them. But the really great thing about this, the whole reason we did it was to make television a citable medium so that we can hold people responsible for what they say. 
so that you can see the context of things. So if somebody, you're you know, watching Fox News, as we all do, um, and you see a quote there and you're like, hmm, I wonder if that was taken out of context, you can actually go and find out now. You don't have to take anybody's word for it. Just go do the research yourself. Yeah, it's super exciting. Nobody's done this before. There are other people who record television on a much smaller scale, um, and in particular news, um, but you haven't been able to do this before, and we just came out with this about a year ago. I was super excited about it. Audio, we've got about two million audio items. The thing that people really know about us for this particular thing, of course, is the live music archive. We have like every show The Grateful Dead has ever done, multiple copies. <laughs> um, but there's 6,000 other bands as well, even though most people don't pay any attention to them at all. Um, <laughs> we have lots and lots of other stuff. My other favorite thing here is the audiobooks. There's a community called LibriVox that uh, is all volunteers who read public domain books, and you can actually just go download it for free, so you don't have to pay for audiobooks anymore as long as you're interested in classics. Um, let's see, what else? Software, we're archiving software. And um, this in particular is Jason Scott. I don't know if you are familiar with Jason Scott. Yeah, some of you are, some of you aren't. So he runs, the, or, well, is a volunteer coordinator or whatever person for a group called Archive Team that runs out and like saves user generated content from websites that are going down. So like, oh, Friendster is disappearing. Oh, Yahoo Video is disappearing. Oh, GeoCities is disappearing. Oh, MobileMe is disappearing. They go out and they try to save that stuff. Um, but he's also really, really interested in software. So he has been working on, in particular, emulating um, uh, hardware and software in a browser. So this, what you're looking at right here, is you can go boot up an Atari 2600 and play Frogger, because don't do it now. You have to pay attention for the rest of this talk. Do not, I will hear it. I, <laughs> I'm gonna hear that. Click, 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 click. Don't do it, okay. <laughs> so let's talk about politics. Yay, politics. Um, the Internet Archive is not a political organization, but we do have a vested interest in making sure that the Internet stays free and open. Um, so this is from the SOPA and PIPA blackout. Everybody remembers the world went dark that day because Wikipedia wasn't available, but we also weren't available. <laughs> uh, we got a lot of upset people about the Wayback Machine, I have to say. <laughs> they were very, very sad. Um, but the other kinds of stuff that we do, I know I was making fun of EFF's website earlier. Um, I, I will make fun of our own website probably as well during the course of this, so um, nobody has to feel bad. But um, we fought a law in Washington. We fought almost exactly the same law in New Jersey. Um, EFF helped us do that. And um, basically it was, they were trying to stop sex trafficking, but the law was written in such a way that they made anybody who hosts content on the internet, including you know, like YouTube or the Internet Archive where you can just click an upload button and put things up there. They were making internet hosts criminally liable for, for things that people posted on their service. So basically it would ruin the entire internet if these things went out. So we can't have that, right? This was the biggie though. EFF and the ACLU helped us fight a national security letter. Um, I don't know if you know what a national security letter is. Hundreds of thousands of these have gone out, literally hundreds of thousands of these. And the person who gets them is not allowed to talk about them to anyone except for their lawyer. Not to the board of directors, not to the people who work at the organization, not to the press, certainly. Um, not allowed to talk about it at all. Until you sue the US government and you win. <laughs> So now I get to talk about it, which is really great. Um, but the cool thing was they wanted uh, patron information from us. They wanted to know who had uploaded something. And we fought them and fought them and fought them and said, we're a library. We do not give out that information. And we finally won. And now that we could talk about it, we basically told the whole world, guess what? We didn't have it anyway. <laughs> Too bad. Um, <laughs> That's why we do that, all of that privacy stuff that we care about so much. Um, there's lots more to talk about there, but it's, um, uh, you know, we could just go on and on and on. And everybody here wants to talk about APIs and stuff, right? I know I do. Okay, cool. So this is my last slide, and then I'll turn it over to her, and she'll get into all the good techie stuff. But um, I just wanted to make sure everybody here is, um, feels included. You know, like we're, we're this really friendly, our website totally sucks, I get it. <laughs> I'm actually working on redesigning it right now, so, you know, pray for me. Um, but we're, we're really, really well aligned with all of you. You know, we care about the same stuff. And um, if you have any questions, 
if you want to work with us on something, if you want to volunteer, if you want to help your community of people who collects media have a place to back it up, anything you want to do, please come talk to us. Send me an email. Um, we'd really, really like to talk to you. So turn it over to Vicky now. Okay, hand off. Okay. So now can I, I've got two hands and three objects. So I, <laughs> Not entirely sure how I'm going to swing this, but um, so how much time do I have? Sweet. So um, I have a lot of stuff to cover. Um, this is uh, a collection of all the Internet Archive APIs and examples of it. Because there is so much to cover, guess what? I'm not going to cover much. We're just going to kind of scrape the top of it, um, kind of a light dusting, so you know these things exist. Again, links for every single thing I'm about to show you, as well as everything Alexis discussed, is all in our Zotero collection. So you can find all of that information. Right? This is what we do at the Internet Archive. We share things. And we archive them. <laughs> I love having a microphone. Anyway, so. Um, so I understand that this is called Internet Archive more than just the Wayback Machine. So naturally, we're going to start with the Wayback Machine API. Um, here is the documentation for it. What the Wayback Machine API will do for you, it will tell you these things. Is a URL archived? And if so, is it available in the Wayback Machine? Um, very simple, just a uh, URL with three parameters, two of which happen to be optional. So here is the URL. This will return JSON, so you can throw this into whatever and get the information back and parse it. Here are your parameters. Naturally, you need the URL, because otherwise, dude, what's the point? Um, then we have an optional timestamp. Uh, if you pass this to the API, it will return the nearest snapshot to that timestamp, if one exists. Um, and then we have a callback with a function name. Um, if you do the JSONP thing, that's where you do it. Um, so this is pretty simple, again, but pretty interesting, powerful stuff. Now I'm going to geek out. And I'm going to also ask that we save questions for the end. I'm sorry, Duke. <laughs> I should have mentioned that earlier. My bad. I meant to put that in the slides. Anyway, so now I'm going to geek out and help support a friend's really awesome project. Um, my friends in Scotland are creating a database of every human being who was in the slightest bit involved with the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745. Um, it's this massive thing that they are doing, um, and it's going to be this really interesting graph database that they are building right now. This is the website for it. Um, I talk to them every month in Scotland, and they're so excited about Jacobites, and I don't know Jack about Jacobites. Um, so not only are we going to support their uh, project here, but I'm also going to see whether there are Jacobite resources available in the Internet Archive. We can all guess. Right, we know. Um, so uh, first of all, I want to make sure that their website, which is very important to them, is actually archived in the uh, Wayback Machine. So I'm going to toss this to curl, because why not? Plus, I can cop, cut and paste things afterward. Um, I don't need a timestamp here, but I threw one on just so we can see what happens. Um, so what does happen is that we get this JSON back. And you can see that, yes, oops. Vicky doesn't know how to use her clicker. Um, but you can see that it is available. Here's a URL where I can retrieve it. It is from September of that same year. And status 200, we all know what those are. Um, so if it had not been available, I would have seen this. All right, we all know what that means. Um, so there's not a lot going on in the Wayback Machine API, but it is super duper useful. And some people are making good use of it. Here's one. This is a WordPress plugin. You can put it on any WordPress installation anywhere. I have it on some of mine. It will go through every single link anywhere on your site. Make sure it's uh, available. If it is broken, it will offer your users to retrieve it from the API. From the uh, API. I've got API on the brain. From the Wayback Machine. Um, so this is really handy for those of us who have WordPress. We do not have a Drupal alternative yet. If we have any Drupal people in the crowd or in the uh, camera audience there, we'd love to see this. That would be amazing. Um, so contact us. Contact her, really. Officially, I don't work for the archive but anymore, but I, I love them. So there you go. Um, so the next thing is a tool from Internet Archive itself. And that is a 404 handler. If you run any sort of website and you've got your 404.html.php.js, whatever the hell you call it, um, 
put this little piece of JavaScript on there. Then when your people get to this 404, they will be sent to the Wayback Machine. Hey, this is broken, sorry. But hey, you can go get it from the Wayback Machine, so they're not left high and dry. You still have to fix your 404, but your users are not screwed. So um, that's pretty cool, and that's the Wayback Machine API. Now we're going to move on to Open Library. This is a big API. Um, so I'm not even going to do much more than introduce the fact that it exists. Uh, so here is the documentation for it, uh, openlibrary.org slash developers slash API. Um, with this, you can do just about everything you can do with Open Library. It is a RESTful API. It returns JSON or RDF, depending upon how you pass your parameters, because yay REST. Um, you can query the Open Library database, view records, edit records, um, view record history, and that's something you may not know about Open Library. This is, in essence, Wikipedia for books. Every single book, one web page. So if you find out that there's a book in your collection that doesn't exist, you can go at it. If someone has wrong information, you can go at it. Misspelling, fix it. So you can do all that with the Open Library API as well, which is really great for those of us who have collections who like to, I don't know, catalog. I've spent way too much time in library world. Um, so, <laughs> own it. Um, so we've got the Open Library API. Because it is so huge, I'm just going to show you one super simple example. And that is I'm going to see whether there are any subjects, books with a subject of Jacobite, want it returned in JSON, because this real estate is pretty small, limit one. All right. So I'm going to throw that. Um, actually, this one I pitched in my browser. It doesn't matter. We all know how to do this shit. Um, so this re gets returned. I get this nice little JSON. Um, I can see here it, we've got Flames in the Heather by Thea Alden. Had there been multiples, you know, nice library stuff. Jacobite right there, um, which means, yay, I can go to openlibrary.org and I can check out this book, except it tells me there is no lending edition, which means I need to go somewhere else. Oh, well. That's OK, because we have Internet Archive, which will have other things. So um, that is a really super simple example of what you can do with the uh, API. Some of the people who are using this API, we've got Evergreen and not listed here. We have Koha. These are open source integrated library systems. Every single thing you can do in a library. Cataloging, ordering books, circulation, finds, everything you can do at a library. You can do with these open source library systems. Because they're so open source, you can go to them and you can contribute right now. You can download, you can install, you can use. They're great, great projects. They use both Evergreen and Koha, the Open Library API, in order to retrieve tables of content, uh, book covers. If there are lendable copies, they will link to them in their ILS, in their OPACs, their uh, online public catalogs. Um, so uh, really great stuff, you doing good things with the Open Library API. Another one. Sorry, no more Drupal still. Drupal people, talk to us. Um, we've got the open book WordPress plugin. Again, plug it into anything you want. Um, and you can, it will go out to open library. You give it an identifier. It will grab all the information and plunk it in a beautiful little entry in your page, in your, your post, in anything. It's really slick and it's super customizable. Um, great stuff. If you happen to do uh, reviews about books or anything like that, this is super handy. Um, so you can see whether websites are available. Um, you can do anything you want in Open Library, but as we saw, I don't have what I need from Open Library. So therefore, I'm going to go to Internet Archive, and I'm going to look it up. This is the IA Search API. It's not so much a search API as an undocumented, easily extrapolatable URL format. Never. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, um, so we've got this. Uh, pretty much it's just based upon the search form at Internet Archive. Uh, I'm going to search for all texts with a subject of Jacobite. I'm going to throw that through my uh, browser, and I'm going to get this URL right here. And as you can see, easily extrapolatable. You all can tell what's going on there, right? Um, we've got 183 entries, lots of Jacobites blocks of Jacobite texts in particular, and the Internet Archive. Um, so that's pretty cool, but if I'm going to programmatically do all this crap, I've now got to scrape this. Who the hell wants to do that? 
in 2014? No one. That's why we have JSON. <laughs> so um, again, easily extrapolatable. If you scroll on down that page, you will see here. You can get it in JSON, XML, HTML table, scraping, um, CSV, RSS. RSS is sweet. Anything in the Internet Archive, you can RSS it and see when somebody updates it. It's pretty sweet. Also, by the way, they have torrent files for every single item. I know, it's awesome. Anyway, easily extrapolatable. We can do this. We can easily build a URL, pitch it to um, whatever tool we're using. It will get stuff. So I did that. I pitched this to my tool. I got that. This is my callback. Again, I limited it to one. This is severely uh, truncated. Um, it doesn't look like it, but I did pull a bunch of crap out of that. Because again, real estate. I'm from San Francisco. I'm really sensitive to real estate. Uh, so uh, you can see all sorts of information here, which I'm not going to go into. But I will point this out right here, which is an identifier. Every single item in Internet Archive has a unique identifier. If you are uploading things to the archive, you get to set that identifier. Um, so I know that this one item right here has this identifier. We'll be using that. Um, so that's pretty cool. So the JSON API is basically Again, it's just another output for the search API. Um, it's Lucene-based, so it has, uh, it's a lot faster than it has any right to be because Lucene, wow. <laughs> go, go Lucene. Um, so because it is Lucene, you can do all sorts of interesting things with it. You can do grouping, fuzzy queries, relevance boost, blah, 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 all the things you're used to doing. Um, so uh, you can do that, and that's neat, but really all this is doing is searching the metadata. So hey, why don't we just give you an API for that? So we do. This metadata API documented at this URL will allow you to data mine 18 plus petabytes of information growing every single day. Are you a researcher? You just hit the jackpot right here. Every single thing. It's amazing. Um, uh, so this is great. So um, I'm going to take that item and I'm going to throw it into the metadata API, my item identifier here, uh, archive.org slash metadata with the identifier. The, if I leave this slash metadata off the end, I'm going to go get way more information than I want. I already do with this right here. So um, I'm just going to limit it to things that are specifically about this physical item, right? And that's what metadata is going to give me in this particular case because I'm uh, library positive, shall we say, and I know what sort of metadata is behind that. So I'm going to throw this to my handy dandy little tool, and I'm going to get this back. Again, severely truncated and incredibly tiny, and you're not going to be able to read it, and I apologize. So I can see, however, that I do have my book, and it's contemporaneous with the uh, period I'm talking about right now. Awesome. Yay. Um, so I can go to Internet Archive, and I can read this object. Online, they've got this amazing open source book reader that anyone can use. Go to their GitHub account, you can see it. It's sweet shit. Um, so this, again, yay sponsors, we love our sponsors. Um, Ontario Council of University Libraries and Member Libraries. Yeah, um, so if I wanted, I could see the physical object by going to Queen's Library in Toronto. All I'm doing is reading the screen. I'm not Canadian. Um, so I've got all this great information, and that is awesome. Um, I can now learn a little bit more about that. So um, what you're going to find as you're crawling around the archive is that uh, a lot of items don't have a lot of metadata, but that's okay. You can fix that. The metadata API allows you to write as well. If there's something you're really passionate about, you can use the metadata API to update the metadata on items and make it much easier for other people to find the things you are passionate about, like, say, the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745. Um, but wait, but wait, there's more if you act now. Um, so you can mine all these 18 plus petabytes of information with all this sort of stuff, and that's great. But let's say you are an amazing open source library. Our open source uh, conference. You've got all these videos. You need somewhere to host them. You need to upload them. What are you going to do? You're going to use the IAS3 API. The documentation is here, and now you see why I am standing in front of you today. I am the maintainer for the IAS3 API because I got really frustrated with there not being any documentation. Oh, good documentation. <laughs> <laughs> Alexis has heard this way too much. Um, uh, yeah, so. Um, one thing you need to remember about the Internet Archive API is that I have 10 minutes and I'm going to start talking really fast. So um, the, I, or the uh, Internet Archive, you can upload anything. 
Okay, if you have copyright over it, if you, you can upload anything. It is free. It is free to host. It is free to, to upload. And it is saved in perpetuity. Right? So if you have any sort of media you wish to save, get it to the Internet Archive. They want it to survive. So the IAS3 API, with that, you can do everything. If you scratch the surface of anything in Internet Archive, you are going to find IA API sneaking, peeking out from underneath. You can create, you can upload, you can metadata, you can download, you can, you can tell it to change formats in the files and transcode them into something else. This is cool shit, baby. So um, it's pretty big. You can do a lot of things. Um, it is called the S3 API because it is a drop-in replacement for Amazon S3. If you have any S3 tools already, change them to point to this server, you're good to go. Bam, it's that easy. If you don't, you can use the S3 API. I don't have a tool, I have curl. Okay, I guess that's a tool. Um, um, so I'm gonna pass it this information. Let's say my friends have already completed their database and as the good humans they are, they're going to upload it to the archive for everyone to use. It will, however, be available on the web. So you'll be able to search it if you like Jacobytes. Here's the file. They're going to upload it to an item name of JDB1745 um, using this. And here's all the metadata information they're going to pass. They could do a lot more, but I've got only so much space. Um, so you pass that in. It uploads. Bam. Bob's your uncle. You're good to go. It's available for everyone. Um, so as you can imagine, it's such a powerful thing. Um, this is used by a lot of places. We've got Recap. Recap is by our beloved Aaron Swartz. Um, we also have the Global Public Safety Codes from Carl Malamute. They are freeing public information which is otherwise behind a paywall. So you can go here and find stuff that you would otherwise have to pay for. We love these men. Aaron, may you rest in peace. We also have Radio Appery. Radio Appery is sweet. It's field recordings. Um, if you want to see or hear what it sounds like in a kitchen in uh, Poland, go to the map, find a recording, listen to it. It's sweet stuff. And they use the IAS3 API. But my favorite hands frickin' down is NASA. Go to Internet Archive, you can find videos from the moon, you can find every single thing that's ever been recorded by Mission Control on the radio, you can find images from Hubble Space Telescope, so much beautiful stuff, it's great. So uh, you're looking at me and you're going, wow, that's really neat. Life is short, I don't like S3. That's okay, because Jake Johnson at Internet Archive has your back. We love Jake. Jake, we love you. Um, so he has taken both IAS3 and the metadata APIs, wrapped them in tasty goodness, and given you utilities to do it for you. Um, so that's really cool. But not only does he have utilities, but he has given you a spiffy little Python library. Only Python so far. Anyone else who's out there who wants to do it in another language, talk to us. We would love to let everyone have a wrapper with another library for their language. So uh, this is pretty sweet. This is something I used to download a uh, collection that had over 400 items. I wanted all the files. So um, I created this script. It's down here. You can find it at uh, GitHub. I'm not a Python programmer. I'm a Perl girl, so apologies in advance for the code. Anyway, I also have this other tool, IA Upload. I, like I said, I am a Perl girl, organizer of San Francisco Perlmongers. Since I came on board, we now record all of our events. And we put them up here at archive.org slash details slash sfperlmongers. I created a script to do that. I maybe only upload one file or so every month or though, so it's not really testing this thing out, putting it through its paces. For that, we have to go to my dear friend, Jason Scott. Um, this is inaccurate. I don't know if you can read it, but it says their own. Um, that, that is accurate. That, that's our boy. Um, but uh, he has uploaded over 300,000 items. Each item can have multiple files. He swears, he lives and dies by the IA wrapper. Um, so he loves this thing. It is amazing. Um, I suggest you check it out. So as you can imagine, really only scrape in the top. There's a huge iceberg underneath of stuff that you have to go looking at. Um, that's where all the cool shit hides. So we're going to recap super fast because this has been slow so far, right? Um, so first of all, you've got the Wayback Machine API and Open Library API, Search JSON, Metadata, IAS3, and thank you, Jake, for IA Wrapper. Amazing stuff. And again, links to all of these are going to be available right here. Um, so you can find that. Um, these will be in our wiki page as soon as I get the chance to put them there. Um, but mostly you'll probably want to see the Zotero link there. Um, so there is really one more important link that I need to uh, need you guys to see. And we're back to Alexis. Wait, guess what it is? 
Yeah. <laughs> you can totally donate to us. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Um, but we also need uh, volunteers to help us go out and get stuff from the web and stick it in the archive. And um, the other thing is we are hiring. Um, we're hiring a senior Wayback Machine engineer. And uh, we have lots of other things that you could probably help us do, given who I'm talking to. Um, so if you're interested, come talk to me after. Um, or you can always contact me at alexis at archive.org. Um, Vicki and I will be, after lunch, we'll be in the Hacker's Lounge um, in the afternoon. So you can come find us. I've got the handy shirt on so you'll know who I am. You know, like you were going to forget this, you know. Um, <laughs> but um, we have a little bit of time for questions, I think, just a few minutes. Uh, we have 4.75 minutes for questions. Go. Cool. Do it. Okay, actually, Go. First, Duke, honey, you have Sorry, yeah, Duke, had, he had his hand up, like, way earlier. Okay. So uh, for the recording, I will try to repeat all of the uh, questions. Uh, Duke's question is, if we have passed a timestamp to the Wayback Machine API, which direction is that? And that is the beginning of the time. So it will go up to that time and see, okay, is there anything there? Okay, is there anything newer? Is there anything newer? Is there anything newer? And if it doesn't find it, then it'll pass you back that JSON string. Next, sir, what's your name? Hi, Jeremy. Oh, okay, repeat. That's, so your question was, what's our policy for taking things out of the Wayback Machine? Um, so what we do is uh, you can contact us, and if it's your stuff and you want to take it out of the Wayback Machine, we'll take it out uh, and do a manual exclusion. Uh, there's a process that you go through to, you know, you know, so it isn't just random people taking things down, you know. Um, but then the other thing is we respect robots.txt. If you still own the domain, uh, you have access to putting a robots.txt file up on that domain. You can specifically tell IA Archiver to not put things in the Wayback Machine. Every time we show you something in the Wayback Machine, we've gone and checked the robots.txt first uh, before we show it to you. Yes? Right, then they can change the robots.txt. At that point, you would have to contact us directly for an exclusion. Yes? Yeah, that, that is actually, yeah, or a fire, let's say. Yeah, that fire that was right next door, yeah. <laughs> so you're asking about uh, having geographic redundancy in our data storage. And um, we have two main data centers. One is in San Francisco, the other is in Richmond. Unfortunately, they're only about 20 miles apart. That is not ideal. Um, we also have a partial copy in Alexandria in Egypt, the Library of Alexandria in Egypt. And uh, I know, right? <laughs> it's perfect. Um, <laughs> and we also have a partial copy in Amsterdam. Um, we would really love it uh, to get another full copy of the Internet Archive in a completely different geographic and governmentally controlled area. It is governments that burn libraries. So um, having a full copy outside of the United States would be really ideal. Um, unfortunately, it's a lot of money involved, and we don't have the funds to do it. Uh, so we, we have the two that are, you know, separated by about 20 miles. So hopefully anything that happened to one, you know, the other one would be fine. And um, thus far, we, we haven't lost any data, so. <laughs> oh, gosh, no, none of them. None. Zero. Yes. Oh, gosh. Um, each petabyte is about 100 to $150,000, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, and we store each one of them twice, so double that. <laughs> right in back? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, well, there you go. That was easy. Yes.
So you're asking about um, trying to convince large numbers of people to put things in the archive because we're way, way smaller than YouTube and you're concerned about our well-being. I appreciate that, but do it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> Please, hurt us. Hurt us. We will go find more money to buy more machines. Go grab as much stuff as you can and put it in the archive. Right now it isn't. Um, if you could somehow magically start putting everything into the archive, we would probably try to find a way to deal with it. Um, there is an API for that, absolutely. Um, we do not currently archive all of YouTube because it is a massive amount of data and we don't really know what's important and what isn't and we have lots of other priorities um, other than YouTube. So like I said during the talk, we actually uh, archive every YouTube video that's tweeted. Um, we archive YouTube videos that are um, embedded in a WordPress blog or that are embedded or linked to from pages that we archive out on the internet. So we have lots of stuff from YouTube. We actually have a dedicated YouTube crawl that uh, does that. But it certainly is not everything. Follow up? Yeah. Yeah, we do. That is correct. You know, yeah. hiring a senior wayback engineer if you want to fix that deep that would, problem. That would totally help. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Pandora. Okay, so you, so you asked me about licensing. I'm gonna talk about general legal things as quickly as I humanly possibly can. The Internet Archive does not have one single lawyer on staff. Round of applause would be appropriate right here. Yes, there we go. Um, <laughs> so um, copyright law is really, really complicated. Um, trying to establish the copyright for one single item out of the 15 or so million, not including the Wayback Machine items that we have publicly available, um, would require an actual court case <laughs> to decide whether something was really actually in the public domain or not in the public domain or whatever. Obviously, we can't do that. So what we do is we try to fulfill our role as a library, uh, which is to have information and make it publicly available while being respectful of the people who created that content. So we honestly kind of use a smell test. Does that answer the question? <laughs> ah. We have not consulted uh, that as far as I am aware. <laughs> um, short on time. We are, OK. Yeah, so we should, plus we don't want to make you late for lunch. We yes, we do not want to make you late for lunch. But we will be downstairs. Oh, I'm sorry. I can project, but this way I'm on recording. Um, so Hacker Lounge, after lunch, we will be down there. Um, we're just going to go pop out and see a little Portlandy for an hour or so. Um, but I do encourage everyone to stampede up here as soon as we finish and get yourself some Internet Archive stickers. Um, and if we have any left later, we will put them on the sticker table downstairs. But, um, you know, knock yourself out. Please be a good citizen. Don't take more than you need. Hey, oh. I will be at the Lego table specifically. So, and I will talk about Internet Archive all day long. So, yeah, come find me. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>